Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Thank you for your introduction, and thank you for having me. Uh, welcome to the Whistle Stop World Tour of the economy. Um, I'm going to try and cover the US, a bit of Europe, a bit of UK, a little bit of China. We can't really talk about developed economies without mentioning China uh, even a, a little bit. Um, uh, so the title kind of gives the game away, growth everywhere, but policy is changing. So um, policy is changing. Rates are going up. The US has started the game. The UK has done a little bit. The markets are pondering when the Europeans might follow. Um, pondering a little bit more about when the Japanese might follow, what the Chinese will do. This is an enormous change, an enormous change compared to just 12, 18 months ago when the US was tentatively moving and nobody else was even thinking about it. So the, the game has changed. Uh, the environment is shifting. Volatility is up. Yesterday was an entertaining day in US markets. And um, uh, this has all been brought about by uh, really a, a fundamental improvement in the global economy. So the policy changes in coming out of the ether, it's not just happening for the sake of it, it's happening because the real economic environment has changed substantially as well, mostly to the upside. Um, of course, this creates threats, it creates opportunities, uh, it creates volatility, um, and uh, I'm going to try and sort of try and highlight some of those stories today and the underlying principles behind them. But the, um, the oh, the joke, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> People who didn't get out yesterday got a problem. This is, this is the core story here, that for the first time since before the housing market crashed, so we've got to go back to 2005, 2006, the theme is tightening rather than easing. Um, and um, you know, I look around trading rooms when I go and visit clients, and I look around, and a lot of these people, I think, you've never seen interest rates going up. You're not old enough. Uh, so it really is quite a shock for a lot of people, uh, but they're going to have to get used to it. Anyway, so the global growth story, let's start with the biggest of the big pictures. That, that increment in the forecast from the IMF, that's our new forecast next week, it doesn't look very big, but it follows several previous years of, of decent growth, and obviously it's a gigantic contrast to the 08-09 experience. Um, this is a solid global performance growth on the IMF's forecast, rising up to 4%. Uh, it was about three and three quarters in 2017, three and a half, three and a quarter the previous few years. Uh, this, is, this is really pretty solid, broad-based global growth. You, you can always find exceptions. There's always somebody who's not going to be doing very well, even in the biggest global boom. But broadly speaking, this is a pretty, uh, pretty strongly, uh, widely spread story. Uh, the manufacturing pickup, so this chart looks like a series of migraines all crushed together. But what this is, is all the purchasing managers indexes for the major economies in the manufacturing sectors. As you can see, since the low point in early 16, a strong, solid uptrend. All of these numbers now are consistent with very strong manufacturing output growth. Now, the share of manufacturing in each of these economies varies enormously. So when we're looking at the US and the UK, strong manufacturing doesn't fix everything because it's only about 12, 13% of GDP. China, it's more than treble that. Uh, and in Europe, it's uh, somewhere in between. But nonetheless, this is a global, synchronized, manufacturing-driven upswing. Uh, and there's no sign, uh, at the moment anyway, of any fading. Maybe those numbers, some of them are leveling off, and I would be quite surprised to see a further step upwards. But equally, in the near term, by which I mean this year, really there's no reason to expect any sort of synchronized step downwards. This is, this is a very solidly based uh, recovery. You can see it reflected in global trade flows, which are picking up really quite rapidly. Uh, and you can even see it in a bit of uh, pricing power uh, you know, China's PPI has swung from minus 3 to plus 5, plus 6. So you know, this, the, the, this is a real sustained recovery. It's been underway for quite a while now. In the US, um, again, you can see the recovery year-over-year year GDP growth, 2.5. Actually, since I did this, we had another number, a new number, which was uh, another solid almost 3% growth in, in the fourth quarter. So picking up nicely. And a real contrast to 14 and 15 when growth slowed down. What happened was that the US responded very badly to the big drop in oil prices, which started in the spring of 2014. Oil was 107 WTI, and it went all the way down, I think, to 27 at the low. So an enormous crunch. What we learned was that the world had changed. So in the olden days, when oil prices fell, everyone just worked out the impact on consumers. Great news, cheaper petrol. They'll spend more. Fine. Um, and kind of ignored the impact on the oil business. Oh, it's all massive companies, very low leverage, very insensitive to cash flows. They won't do very much. Actually, the U.S. oil business had changed completely. Uh, it's now dominated, certainly in 2014 it was, dominated by the shale business, lots of small players, very highly leveraged, um, no protection when prices fall, 
Revenues crash, they cut their capital spending immediately. A completely different world that every economist, me included, failed to spot. And what it meant was that actually the drop in oil prices, the really big story, it wasn't that consumers spent more, they did, but was that capital spending well, just collapsed. Uh, it fell in the oil business by 62% peak to trough. It's one of my favorite statistics because it's 62% of quite a big number. The oil business is incredibly capital uh, spending intensive. Um, it's a massive outlier. Nobody works there. I mean, you need a few people to you know, work the pumps and things, but really, it's a capex business and nothing else. So when you get a capex meltdown in the oil business, it really matters. Um, and global, you know, U.S. growth slowed from nearly 4% year over year uh, to 1% year over year. Uh, it was a really very big deal, but it's over. Oil is back in the mid 60s. Uh, the rig count, uh, U.S. activity in drilling, has doubled, since, more than doubled since the low. Growth has picked back up again. There's the capex story. You can see the blue line: oil capex completely collapsing, and then the rest of it following behind. So if you're not in the oil business, but your customers are, and your customers cut their spending by 62%, you've got a problem. And that's exactly what happened. But both of those stories are now rebounding, leading the whole US recovery story. The consumer, meanwhile, is as happy as a clam. Um, blue line is consumer confidence. It's obviously extraordinarily high. Uh, the black line is spending, which isn't quite keeping up. People don't have the cash to spend as much as they'd like, but they have enough to spend plenty. So. I, that gap's not going to close. We're not going to see U.S. consumption rising 5%. There's just nowhere near enough cash flow. And the saving rate is so low, as it is in the U.K., that cutting it even further doesn't really seem like an option. So I think that gap will persist. But nonetheless, it's quite comforting to look at a chart like that. If you're worried about the downside for consumer spending and you look at the confidence numbers, it's, it's pretty hard to see it. We're going to see continued strength in U.S. consumption, continued strength in U.S. capex. That's 85% of the economy. As a result, oh, there's always a catch. Here's the catch. Uh, the unemployment rate is now well below the level that the Fed thinks is sustainable, which is 4.6. We are currently at 4.1. Let's conduct a thought experiment. What happens this year if we just carry on doing what we've been doing over the last year? Um, and that's what the blue line does. It just projects forward at the same rate. Um, where does that put unemployment a year from now? 3.4. Let's call it 3.5. The U.S. hasn't had a sub-4 unemployment rate since the late 60s, when it was actually 3 and a half. 1969 was the last time. Uh, looking around, I think few of you can remember what U.S. inflation was in 1969. So here's a reminder. It was 6%. Cool. 6%. Um, I'm not forecasting U.S. inflation of 6% anytime soon, but... Uh, 1969 had a few things going on. They were paying for Vietnam with printed money, uh, and of course we had the breakdown of the Bretton Woods exchange rate system. A lot of other stuff going on. But nonetheless, when you peel back the history books and look at the US to try and find a time when it's managed to sustain a 3.5 unemployment rate without everything going horribly wrong, you will come up short because it hasn't happened. So um, this is why the Fed is raising rates. So uh, they raised in December 15 was the first one. Then they waited a year because they were worried about this, the slowdown in, in the economy because of the oil meltdown raised again in, in December 16, and then uh, they've speeded things up. So they hiked in December, last December, they hiked in previous June and the previous March. Uh, we get a Fed meeting today, not going to do anything, but they are going to hike again in March when Jay Powell takes over as chair, Yellen walks off into the sunset, and I think the first thing Powell will do will be to carry on what Yellen would have done, which is to raise rates again. They can't live with this. This is the bottom line. The, the, there's, the Fed... It's kind of split on the details, but there's nobody there who thinks the U.S. can run a 3.5% unemployment rate and not have a problem uh, through the, uh, the, the impact on, on wage growth. And in fact, that straight-line forecast there might not be bullish enough. Uh, you know, given the acceleration in capital spending that's underway at the moment, you know, if you want to tell me, if you want to sort of bang the table and say, actually, that unemployment rate is going to be 3 and a quarter, and by the end of, or by the middle of 2019, it's going to be 2 and 3 quarters, I'm probably not going to argue it's, it's entirely possible. So that really is very uncharted territory. And as they keep saying, we can't wait till we get there before we address the potential consequences in terms of inflation by raising interest rates. Interest rates work with a very long lag. You, can't, you don't have the luxury of waiting and seeing whether your inflation model is actually going to be right, because if it turns out that it is, it's too late to deal with it. So that's why, despite what look like very benign inflation numbers, they're going to keep uh, raising rates. Um, 
the wage picture has been pretty benign. The, the, the blue line is my projection for the, the, the next year, uh, which is a, you know, a clear uptick from where we've been over the last year, rising up to, I don't know, maybe three and a quarter, three and a half. Um, that's not bad by previous standards. You go back to 2006 and wage growth was 4%. You go back to the previous cycle, it was 4%. But they've already told us that their threshold, their tolerance this time is not 4%. So when people say to me, well, there's nothing to worry about. Wages are only rising 25 they normally don't panic till it gets to four. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that productivity growth now, as it is in the UK, is a lot lower than it used to be. So it used to be, it was a very simple calculation. You can tolerate 4% wage growth because you can assume 2% productivity, which means you'll get 2% inflation, which is the target. Fine. But if productivity is only growing at one, and I'm being kind of generous, uh, and you've still got a 2% inflation target, then your wage threshold is only three. So suddenly, the margin of error that the Fed's got, the room for maneuver that they've got, um, the ability they've got to sit back and, and take things easy, is diminished. And that's why the speed of the rate increases has gone up. They just don't think they've got as much room for maneuver as some people in the markets think. The game really has, has changed. You know, after the crash, productivity growth has been a lot lower. And again, this is a very similar theme in the UK. Uh, inflation is going to go up anyway this year, no matter what happens to wages, because we had some weird numbers in the spring of last year. You can see that sudden dip in early 17. That pulled down break-even inflation rates in the U.S. quite substantially. That's all reversed in anticipation of the unwinding of this effect, um, and U.S. inflation is going to pop substantially higher starting in March. Now, some of this is just mechanical, just last year's stuff working out of the calculation. But um, you know, I I'm expecting that with the bigger wage gains, passing through into services, we're going to see some uptick. And we're going to get quite close to the Fed's target. So the blue line is the, is the PCE deflator, which is their actual target variable. And you can see I've got it nudging 2% at the end of the year. It wouldn't take much of an error in that forecast to put it at 2%. Uh, and um, that, that will change a lot of people's minds about how serious the Fed is about continuing to tighten. They mean it. This, this is, the game has changed. You know, very recently, until very recently, this is a common story here. Well, they promised they'd raise rates four times in 2015, and they only did one. They promised they'd raise rates four times in 2016, and they only did one. So why should we take them seriously now? Well, they did hike three times last year, uh, and they're going to hike three times this year at least. And they're probably going to keep going after that as well. This is a, a fundamental shift. The dollar's weakening as well, which is uh, a new story in the, in the equation. After you know, 30 years of U.S. Treasury Secretary saying one thing and one thing only, a strong dollar is good for America, along comes Steve Mnuchin uh, last week and says a weak dollar would be good for our trade. Well, thank you, Steve, for upending 30 years of policy convention. Uh, but that's what he did. Um, and he was pushing on an open door because the dollar's been weakening anyway for a while. It's, this is not going to turn the inflation story upside down. This is not a big open economy where the exchange rate is the key to everything. But it does matter. So uh, looking at the, at the chart there, the blue line is the dollar. It's inverted. So as that blue line is rising, the dollar is falling. 10% drop in the dollar is going to push up goods prices by about 2%. That's a quarter of the CPI. So it puts up inflation by about a quarter, of, uh, half a point, half a point. That's not a massive deal. But if you're already maybe nudging the target, then adding half a point is a problem. So the Fed isn't yet, I think, in the game of worrying too much about the dollar. But if it keeps falling, they will be. And it might. Um, a lot of talk now in the US, you've probably seen it in some of the UK media as well, about this idea that, well, if productivity picks up, that will, that will fix everything. And now that we've got stronger capital spending, blue line, productivity is probably going to pick up, black line. And yeah, they do sometimes move together. Not always. I'd love to see this. But it wouldn't fix every problem that we've got. It wouldn't necessarily stop the unemployment rate falling, and that's where the, the, the tightening is. Uh, it would be helpful to corporate earnings. It would be helpful to the stock market. But it wouldn't fix everything. The reason it wouldn't fix everything is that we need to get more people back in the labor force. If we're going to get stronger growth, even with stronger productivity, we need more people working. And US labor participation plummeted after the crash uh, and hasn't recovered at all. Now, there's a lot of forecasts. A lot of forecasts, a lot of sell-side forecasts in particular, are assuming that we're going to get this year a pickup in productivity. OK, not arguing too much about that. But we're also going to get, finally, a pickup in participation. We're finally going to suck back these people who've just not been uh, active in the labor force. Um, the problem is there's no sign of this at all. L look at that chart and tell me where the upturn is, because I can't see it. 
Uh, and if you can, it probably means I need new contact lenses. It's just, there's nothing happening there at all. Uh, the data are very unreliable. You can see we've had, what, four little attempts at running at participation in the last few years. They've all reversed. There's been no meaningful improvement. Part of the problem is that all the action in the US labor market is in the small business sector. And when I say small, I mean teeny. You know, you, you, we're talking companies with 10, 15 employees here. And there's a massive mismatch between what they want and what's available among these people who are currently sat outside the labor force. Disproportionate number of these people are ex-public sector workers. In the bizarre world of US public finances, when the economy gets weaker, teachers get fired, policemen get fired, firemen get fired. It's bizarre because state and local government finances are very tied to the local economy, and the federal government typically doesn't bail them out. So when they see their property taxes and their income taxes fall, they fire people. A disproportionate number of those people are still outside the labor force. Um, so the, the, the recovery in private sector jobs has been gigantic. Public sector still hasn't recovered all the losses after the crash. So a lot of these people who dropped out are ex-public sector employees. Back in 2008, at the time of the crash, the typical public sector employee was an administrator, age 43. So that person is now 53, hasn't worked for 10 years, and has their life experience in the public sector. You are a small private sector employer with about 10 people on your payroll looking for somebody else to come and join your scrappy little business. How far down the list is that 53-year-old ex-public sector employee who hasn't worked for 10 years? They're not on the list at all. You're not going to hire them. It's not going to happen. So I'm profoundly skeptical of this idea that we're going to get this miraculous pickup in participation, which will stop the unemployment rate falling. Um, we'll get faster productivity growth. We'll get faster wage growth, but it won't be inflation. And everything will be great forever. Um, that's basically the kind of sell-side view of the world. I'm not suggesting for a minute it's driven by their necessity to be bullish on equities, but it is. Um, anyway, um, I mean, <laughs> I've been on the sell side. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Europe, well, kind of in some ways a similar story. That, the, the downshift in European growth in 1516 wasn't as severe as the US because Europe doesn't have any oil. Um, but the, the upturn has been really quite remarkable. This is uh, you know, the consequence of an extraordinarily long period of, of super easy monetary policy from the ECB, negative interest rates, a massive expansion of the balance sheets, huge compression of yields, you know the story. Um, and it's finally working. European growth surprised everybody to the upside. You, you wouldn't have found anybody uh, at the end of last year who would have expected <coughs> European growth to pick up in the way that it did in 2017. And uh, it's been a really remarkable turnaround. And there's ECB's balance sheet, uh, quite an, as an astonishing uh, expansion. Um, government bonds are, of course, now buying a vast proportion of corporate issuance as well. It isn't going to get, uh, it isn't going to get uh, significantly bigger, and uh, we're expecting that um, you know, by the end of this year they'll have, they'll have stopped, uh, and maybe raising rates a little bit uh, towards the end of the year or, or into early 19. So not a Fed-style sustained tightening, but nonetheless a change in the environment, you know, stopping buying assets and, um, and no further rate cuts. Uh, in, in Europe, where the banking system still kind of dominates the, the, the capital market picture to an extent that it really doesn't in the U.S., um, you can, you can forecast growth through the money supply. This doesn't work for anywhere else really anymore. But the blue line is European uh, money growth and the black line is GDP growth. Yeah, pretty decent fit. Um, the story for, for this year is uh, you know, to expect a further acceleration in European growth. You know, taking last year's chart and just extending it into even more wonderfulness probably is overdoing it a bit. But um, it's certainly not going to roll over. Again, you know, the theme for this year is another year of solid growth. Maybe a little bit weaker, but you know, do we measure it that accurately? Not really. Um, the one thing where just the outlier to the upside is going to be construction, where we're actually bullish as hell because there's been no real recovery from the crash, but construction sector sentiment has now gone through the roof. So that's just, just a little asterisk there that actually European construction looks a pretty good place to be. Uh, the labor market in Europe is tightening. Now, the unemployment rate is still very high, but uh, you know, it's been falling. It was 12% it was in, in 2013, uh, and now it's heading towards 8, maybe even below 8. Um, the black line is European inflation, which kind of lags core inflation, does lag the, the, the labor market. I'm not suggesting there's a mechanical short-term relationship, but broadly speaking, as in the US, ultimately, if you tighten the labor market far enough, you're going to get some inflation pressure. And um, our inflation forecast, I realize, looks quite aggressive to the upside. But, but given what we're seeing in, uh, potentially in, in, in wage growth, especially in Germany, where the labor market is as tight as the US, um, we're looking at, uh, at the inflation picture changing uh, to the upside. Again, you know, look, at the, look at the end of the chart. Early 19, we've got inflation at 
the ECB doesn't need to be tightening aggressively. But it's a massive change from endless talk of deflation, disinflation, where is the inflation, where is the wages. Um, it, it's a complete change in the mood. Um, and this is throwing up some what look like really remarkable anomalies. And the dollar probably is, is the biggest of these anomalies. So the blue line is the one-year, one-year um, forward spread, which until, what, about April the 20th uh, last year, predicted movements in, in euro-dollar more or less perfectly. And um, there's a lot of people trading off this and doing very nicely. Uh, and then it all went spectacularly wrong. Uh, and it's worth thinking about this because this really is, to my mind, this is the story in markets at the moment, the, the astonishing divergence of the dollar from where it really probably ought to be. So just looking at, at rate spreads, the, the dollar-euro should be at about, what, 0 0.97, and it's at 124. That's a fairly gigantic divergence. So what on earth happened in April last year? Well, um, a few things happened in April last year. First, the U.S. surprisingly, um, well, very surprisingly, printed an extraordinarily weak core inflation number at the same time that there was a run of horrible other data as well. None of it mattered very much. It was all transitory. That was the Fed's description of it at the time. Well, it was half the Fed said it was transitory, including Yellen. But the other half of the Fed said, well, actually, maybe this is the start of a renewed weakening and a new structural period of disinflation. It wasn't. It was transitory. Um, but the market didn't hear that. The market heard the, ah, well, low inflation number and a weak payroll number, weak housing starts, weak industrial production, all at the same time. This has got to be connected. It's a big picture story. And then a few weeks later, that view appeared to be reinforced because after that very surprising March inflation number released in April, everybody forecast a big rebound in April. Didn't happen. Got another weak number. And then in May, everyone forecast a big rebound. Didn't happen. And in fact, the inflation numbers undershot five months running, which I don't think has ever happened before. It was a, without boring you with the details, it was, just, it was a bunch of unconnected factors. It was transitory. And by the time we got to the fourth quarter, the numbers had been reverted. But the market didn't hear that. The market heard a constant run of low inflation numbers. And they heard some of the Fed doves talking about how it could be permanent um, and sold the hell out of the dollar, even though the Fed was saying, actually, we're going to keep raising rates and shrink our balance sheet. Market didn't hear it. At the same time, the European numbers were starting to surprise to the upside, substantially and consistently. And Draghi was still saying, well, we're not going to do anything about this. You know, this is not going to force a quick change in policy. We're still below our inflation target. We still don't see we're going to get to that inflation target anytime soon. And the rates market heard that, but the FX market didn't. And then we had the French elections, which, you know, had Le Pen been elected, probably would have been the end of the euro. That didn't happen. So you know, immediately after that, we saw a big inflow into European equities. That certainly supported the euro. I think it's on the next chart. Yeah, there we go. So um, on the right-hand end, the, uh, the blue line is uh, European equity portfolio inflows. And you can see in uh, spring 17 onwards, there's a big spike to the upside. It certainly supported the euro. Also, go back again. What happened during this period of dollar weakening was uh, a recognition that well, actually the US is going to go and cut taxes. Uh, it is going to raise the funding requirement substantially. The Fed is serious about shrinking its balance sheet. And actually, let's do the maths. The Fed is saying that a year from now, they're going to stop reinvesting 30 billion treasuries a month. That doesn't sound like very much. But over a year, that's 360 billion treasuries that they're going to be releasing from their, their, their portfolio. Um, so somebody else has got to roll that over now. And they're going to cut taxes substantially, more issuance. Uh, and the budget deficit is pretty big anyway. And the current account deficit is pretty big and getting bigger. Um, so maybe, you know, given there's all these reasons not to like the dollar, and there's quite a lot of reasons to like the euro, maybe this one-year, one-year spread thing isn't the story anymore. And so it's proved. And what we've seen instead is a sustained strengthening of the euro. Now, the twist in the story is that this is really not what the ECB wants to see. The ECB's inflation forecasts are pretty much mechanically driven by whatever's happened to the euro. When the euro goes up, their inflation forecasts go down, and that means that their tightening is pushed into the future. So we've got a real kind of conflict going on here between rates markets, the ECB, the foreign exchange market, and in, in some ways, the US fundamentals. Because the fact is that you know, the US needs to raise a lot of foreign money over the next year. And the two biggest buyers of the past decade, China and Japan, aren't buying anymore. 
So the game really has changed, and what that means is that the dollar is unanchored. And on top of that, nobody knows what the hell dollar policy is anymore. It used to be very straightforward. A strong dollar is good for America. Now it's whatever Mnuchin or Trump think on any given day. Well, think, that's probably being kind. Whatever they say on any given day. Um, yes, the man who produced the Lego movie is now in charge of the dollar. Great. Anyway, um, meanwhile, back in Britain, <laughs> Um, yes, uh, so the UK is growing, and so the Brexiteers are excited. See, we told you it wouldn't be so terrible, except when you compare our growth to everybody else, it is pretty terrible. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, the, we're the worst performing of the, of the majors of, of, over the last year. It's not bad, but a rising tide lifts all the boat. It's just that if your boat is leaking, you don't rise so far. Um, the big problem here is that UK businesses, on, on the face of it, ought to have loads of money to spend. Well, they have got loads of money to spend, but they're just hanging on to it. So, since the Brexit vote marked on the chart there, you can see there's been a, a big uh, sustained increase in um, private non-financial corporations' holdings of, of, of cash and, uh, and deposits. They're, they're sitting on the money because of the uncertainty. And so as a share of GDP, you know, they've, they've never had more cash, but they're not spending it. And uh, I think until there's some real clarity on, on the post-Brexit arrangements, that could take a long time, they're going to sit there. And so that means that, yeah, we can continue to grow, but we probably continue to underperform everybody else. Uh, had a big rise in inflation last year, entirely due to the drop in, in the pound. Uh, that, will, that will reverse, and so inflation will come back down again. So people who are worrying about the Bank of England having raised rates once and continuing and becoming more aggressive, uh, I think that's unlikely. The bank underestimated how far inflation would rise after the pound dropped, and I think they're now underestimating how far inflation will fall now that the pound's gone up. I mean, the you know, cable's at 141, 142 now. That's really quite a big shift from the, immediately, the immediate post-Brexit uh, um, drop. So I'm not worried about UK inflation. I'm not worried about the Bank of England being forced to follow the Fed. That's, that's not going to happen. So the low rate environment here is going to remain, but, um, but the currency volatility could, could still be uh, uh, quite substantial. Uh, the consumer can't rescue the economy, you know, just, you know, the corporate sector is not doing very much. The consumers can't pick up the baton because they're not saving anything. Saving rates are extraordinarily low. Um, so income growth, disposable income growth this year will pick up, lower inflation, more money to spend. But even allowing for that, you know, it's, it's very hard to see spending uh, strengthening substantially because the saving rate is so low. People do need to rebuild, especially because fiscal policy is tightening. So the latest budget, uh, you know, Hammond's latest budget, does show that the fiscal tightening this year is going to squeeze consumers' incomes much more than it did last year or the year before, and that will offset the benefit of lower inflation. So it's another year of constrained consumers and businesses on the sidelines. And again, that's 85% of the economy. It's a real struggle to see the UK keeping up with Europe or, or no chance of keeping up with the US. Um, our, our view, um, for what it's worth, and we could talk about this all day, is that the most likely outcome here is that we get a very soft Brexit with a very long transition period. Um, and so we kind of, what we do is we stand on the threshold of leaving the EU more or less forever. And uh, yeah, that's a re partly a reflection of the change in the political environment. You know, there's been a real shift in public opinion now. Uh, uh, substantially more people think that leaving the EU was a mistake. There's the, the talk of the second referendum is, is kind of building up. Um, the, 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 the very aggressive Brexiteers in the Conservative Party are getting very twitchy. They feel they're losing ground. Um, I think Labour's position is probably going to shift very soon, having been sat on the fence just watching the Tories implode over it. I think Labour's going to come out with a much clearer position, which will involve something like remaining in the customs union and something like the single market for a very long time. And the debate is moving. So I think the final outcome, whatever, you know, whenever it is, is likely to be much softer rather than harder. And I think the, you know, the FX market is listening to that. That's why cable's at 141 and not at 121 anymore. So um, you know, this is going to drag on for a very long time. The uncertainty is not going to go away. But I do think the crashing out scenario is actually now very unlikely. Briefly, in China, we, you know, we have to think about China because it is now such a, a swing player in the, in the global economy. China probably slowed quite a lot at the end of last year. So there's the official numbers, which are the blue bars. And you can believe those if you like, and you know, I wouldn't. <laughs> then, there's, then there's the black bars, which is um, our sort of re-estimated re tweaks based on, on, on various private data and public data. Uh, you can see it, it looks like things fell off a cliff in the fourth quarter, but they didn't. What actually happened was that China imposed production curbs on a lot of northern cities to stop everyone choking to death in the winter. And so there's been a big drop in industrial output. But it will, it'll rebound. But it, you know, the days of 7% growth forever are, are over. 
Um, you can see that, that impact. The black line is, is our estimate of industrial production last year. You can see the big slowdown. This is not the end of the world in China. This is the production curbs, and it'll probably uh, rebound. Um, but having said that, you know, the fact is that uh, this is kind of similar to that European chart of money supply and, and economic growth. China's money supply growth has slowed, and China's economic growth is going to slow. Just to be clear, this is not the meltdown that everybody's scared of. Uh, you know, China is, China's banking system is an accident waiting to happen, but this isn't it, probably. Uh, the public sector's cutting back as well, so a big slowdown in public investment, uh, including infrastructure. Um, you know, having been growing at 12, 14 percent, you know, when that grows, when growth there slows to zero, you're going to see a hit in, in, in China's economic growth and China's contribution to global demand, global commodity demand, um, and uh, this is likely to persist. The industrial sector is still pretty cheerful. Um, the survey evidence is still pretty strong, as it is in Europe and the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, but again, where's the move to the upside from where we are now? It, it probably isn't happening. Um, the currency is strengthened again. This is not what they want. A shed load of foreign, um, uh, foreign, foreign debt is, is helped by a stronger uh, currency, but of course exporters are hurt by it. Uh, I suspect that China's policy towards the yuan will change. They won't follow the, the Fed raising rates. They can't. There's way too much debt, uh, and the yuan will, will turn around and, and, and weaken again. I love this chart. It looks very simple, so let me explain why I love it so much. So what it is, this is, this is bank assets as a share of GDP in China, uh, and the U.S. over the last uh, dozen years or so. The point about it is that the China numbers are insanely gigantic. So let's just look at the black line, which is the U.S., and look at 2008, 2009. This is the crash. Um, it's barely visible on the chart. Now, if I were just to put the U.S. numbers on a chart by themselves, what you would see is a gigantic run-up in U.S. banking sector assets before the crash, then a big collapse afterwards. But because China's... Um, the debt position is so enormous, it renders the U.S. pre-crash period pretty much invisible. This is clearly, eventually, going to end in a lot of tears. The, the good thing, or the good news, is that I've written China bank assets at the top of the page, and, and, and you know that's what, in theory, they are. But this is a fiction. These are basically assets of the state. I don't care what the, what the plaque says above the door in a Chinese bank, you know, because effectively they are arms of the state. And this debt will be nationalized very quickly. Of course, ultimately, a lot of the U.S. debt was nationalized as well through the TARP. Um, but that was a political process which almost failed. Remember the vote on TARP in Congress that failed and watching the Dow melting down at the, when they were tallying the votes? Yeah, that won't happen in China. Uh, definitely not. What will happen instead is that the state will, will absorb these, these uh, liabilities. But, you know, if it all goes horribly wrong, depending on the exact size of the losses, you know, China's government could be on the hook for 30% of GDP pretty much overnight. That's the accident. Um, but, you know, uh, and, and it will happen at some point, and um, it will be very, very bad for the global economy. But we don't have a trigger point this year, next year. I don't see it being an imminent threat. But whenever anyone says to you, oh, uh, you know, it'll be okay, there's no black swans in the world at the moment, well, you know, show them that. Um, I'll skip Japan because I think we're running out of time. Let me just wrap up. Um, so, big picture, global growth is, is strong, it, it pretty much everywhere. Um, there's a cost to strong growth for a long time, which is that labor markets become too tight and they scare the pants off central banks. In their own ways, balance sheet reduction or just not expanding the balance sheets anymore or actually raising rates, the, the, world, the, the environment's changing. We're going to see tighter central banks everywhere over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. Not because it's an inflation disaster, you know, but it, it's simply because of the lags and because the starting point is so accommodative. U.S. real interest rates, after all, are still negative with a 4.1% unemployment rate and heading to 35 they They've got negative real interest rates. That, that cannot last, especially when you've got the lunatics in the White House cutting taxes in an economy which does not need a penny of tax cuts. They're getting $100 billion this year and another $150 billion next year. The Fed cannot stand back and watch this happen. So the uplift in, in global yields, which is a combination of rising real yields and rising inflation expectations together, uh, that continues. Probably not at the sort of frantic pace we've seen in the last couple of months, but that gradual upshift in, in yields is going to continue, led by the U.S. So spreads can widen, but the U.S. You know, is, the, is the anchor for developed market bond yields. They're going to rise everywhere. Um, and eventually, speculative punt, the dollar goes back up at some point. Um, but 
Currencies overshoot, currencies undershoot. We know this from painful experience after painful experience. Currencies don't always do what they should do or what you think they're going to do or what they eventually do in the long term. In the short term, they can do something very different. And when the Treasury Secretary, who's got the biggest platform in the world, stands up and says, eh, weak dollar, fine. You know, that's an open invitation for it to get substantially weaker. That's a problem with you know, pushing on an open door. You just never know how far it's going to swing. And what it might do is swing so far that it hits a doorstop and then comes back and smacks you in the face. I would like to be in the room when that happens to Steve Mnuchin. And if Trump's standing next to him, it would be even better. Um, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.